Please remain standing for the reading of the King's Law from 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 20. Under the inspiration and authority of God's Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul writes, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also from youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. It is our sure and certain foundation. It is a lamp to our feet, O Lord, a light to our path. It is infallible, inerrant, and inspired by you. So as we meditate upon this passage, O Lord, we ask for your grace and goodness to open our hearts and minds, to teach us, O Lord, to not just intellectual facts or academic concepts, but rather, Lord, principles of how you want us to live in this sinful, fallen world. Lord Jesus, we have nothing unless you give it. So we humbly ask, O oh Lord, that you feed us now. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In our series on the Ten Commandments or the Moral Law, we've seen that it's an expression of the unchanging character of God. <clears throat> uh, though <clears throat> it's, it's basically God's revealed will. This is what God is like. And even though the commandments are couched in the negative, Remember, this is a 3,500-year-old document, and their writing styles were different and, than the way that we would write today. And so Christians have recognized throughout history that when the moral law is couched in negative terms, thou shalt not, it also implies directly the opposite. If thou shalt not do this, then you shall do this instead. And so, for example, when it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What God is also saying is that you must have me as your God exclusively. You must love me, which is why the Lord Jesus summarizes the law as saying to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. When it says to do not take my name in vain, it also means to use his name with meaning and with purpose and to glorify God Almighty. When it says do not worship idols, do not you know, uh, you know, worship graven images, it means worship me in spirit and in truth. And in all the other commandments there that are, are meant to be understood in that particular process. For example, when it says do not kill, it means that not only do you avoid killing someone else, but you also have the responsibility to preserve and protect the life of someone. And so when we come to do not commit adultery, it is not simply a prohibition against immoral, illicit acts against the integrity and the covenant of your family, but it's also a requirement that you fulfill your duties and obligations to your partner. You be devoted to that particular partner, that you fulfill your responsibilities under God's law, which is why we spent so many weeks looking at it. <clears throat> While there are godless, wicked men and women who deceive their partners from the very beginning of their marriages, Almost always we've seen when adultery happens, it's because there's something that's gone wrong. Now, okay, when I say that, remember, okay, people can get married, they might not know the other person. At the moment that they say their vows, they might be sincere, but then because their lives are lived based upon their feelings, when their feelings change, they no longer think that their vows are appropriate. And so what happens then, in my experience, with all due respect to everyone involved, usually when adultery occurs, it occurs because basically one partner or the other thinks they can get something by breaking God's law that they're not getting within the marriage. It could be because they fell in love and their hearts and you know, their minds, and you know, they were consumed with that incredibly powerful feeling that we call romantic love. And I call it romantic infatuation. And so then when they get married and after six, six months or a year or so, those feelings drop away, you know, then they think, well, we've lost something. We've lost something spicy. We've lost something significant. I want to I recapture the thrill. Well, you can't 
recapture the thrill. And so what happens, though, if you think that that's what marriage is about and you're not getting it from your partner, there might be a temptation to get it from somebody else. You meet somebody else. This person makes you feel incredible, makes you feel wonderful, and therefore you think you found this thing, but you'll find out that that person will also end up, that those feelings will go away and that person will disappoint you as well. Or it could be something like, for example, you have a, uh, a synergy between the two of you where you can talk, you can share, you can laugh together, and it seems you're on the same page. And But then over time, the marriage starts breaking down, the, the, the trauma of life comes up. It's like the illustration of the four soils and in Mark, where basically, you know, your, 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 your seed starts to grow and then basically it gets choked out by weeds. And so then you think that you can get that same kind of intimacy, fellowship, communication, et cetera, by going outside of your marriage bonds. So basically what we want to do here in this particular section of the study of the Ten Commandments is learn how to prevent those things from happening, how to secure our relationship with our spouses so that those kinds of things will not happen. Remember, folks, every single relationship you have has a cost associated with it. It doesn't matter what the relationship is. It's going to take you, if nothing else, time. A lot of times, it's going to take a lot more than If you want to be close to someone, not only do you have to spend time with them, but you have to deal with the fact that this is a person who has fallen short of the glory of God, just as you have. And that means there are going to be difficulties, conflicts, irritations, disappointments, frustrations. And learning how to deal with those is an essential part of making any marriage work well. The problem is most Christians do not understand God's precepts. They don't understand his principles. And they they picked up their, which is not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, they picked up their, their conflict handling problems from their own family, and or they picked it up from the world, and they haven't really thought about what does God say about these things. And over the years, when I have studied in various things, when I have been involved in various ministries, when I've attended various seminaries and colleges and universities, all from a particular Christian uh, perspective, one of the things that shocks me is how few of these, these radical light principles that are clearly delineated in scripture are not understood or practiced by the average Christian. I have known presbyters at presbytery gossip like a bunch of schoolgirls rather than sit down and follow biblical procedures when they've got a conflict or a problem with someone else. They don't understand or they're not willing to submit. Now, I've listened to some of these men preach, and I'll have to say they are very talented orators. They have very good, well-prepared sermons. Their exegesis is top-notch. Their their homiletics is is incredible. They give you a much better, more developed intellectual sermon than you'll ever get from this failed pastor behind the pulpit this morning. Where the problem breaks down is that they lack application. For all of their knowledge of Greek and Hebrew and the perfect and you know all the things that, that they can bring in, their historical analysis, the theological analysis, it's wonderful stuff that they're saying. There's not a single thing doctrinally wrong with what they say, but they do not always know how to make that applicable in their life. Their basic skills in life, their basic values, the way that they approach problems, difficulties, frustrations, and irritations are more indicative of their social class than it is of biblical principles themselves which is why for this morning's text, looking at this aspect of protecting ourselves from adultery, I chose 2 Timothy 2, 20 and following, specifically verses 23 and following, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those in opposition, if perhaps God will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. Now in context, obviously, this is not talking about marriage. These are pastoral instructions from an older pastor, the Apostle Paul, to a younger pastor, Timothy. Timothy was a kid that that came from a a Christian home. Uh, He was circumcised by Paul, and well, not by Paul, but circumcised so that he could attend Jewish functions, but he had a a, a Gentile father, but a a Jewish mother. But he, the Jewish mother, loved the scriptures from an early age. Almost for sure, you can guarantee that, that probably her marriage was one that was made by her parents 
because she seems to have been a godly woman, as was her own particular mother. So Timothy grew up, he had learned the scriptures as a child, and now he's in a position, the apostle Paul is arrested in prison, <clears throat> maybe about ready to face his death. So Paul is trying to encourage him in how to continue the ministry after he's gone and laying the foundation. So this is about advice from an elder pastor to a younger pastor. But the point here is that the information is so beautiful and it's so relevant. I don't think it's just advice for pastors. I think this is the way that all Christians are supposed to solve problems. This is how they're supposed to engage in difficulty. Remember, there's nothing in scripture that says that we're going to, once we're married, we're never going to have another problem again. What it means is that problems are going to come. It's how we deal with them that determines our sanctification, not the absence of them. And that's the problem right there, is that because we don't understand it, in the average church, in my experience, and it could be wrong, but I have been in Arminian churches, charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches, Baptist churches, lots of Baptist churches, and even in Reformed churches, basically what happens is that people put on their best clothes on Sunday, and they smile, and they're nice, and they want to be nice. And the idea is that the church is a nice place full of nice people doing nice things. Isn't it nice to be nice to the nice? And so there's a thin veneer of niceness, but underneath, in the terms of how we deal with our anger, our lust, our, <clears throat> our temptations, our weaknesses, our frailties, how we deal with our, our annoyances, how we deal with our frustration, those things are more determined by our social class than they are by the word of God. And the word of God is seldom preached on these particular issues. And the reason why is because if a pastor gets up and starts saying, hey, people, no more gossip, right? Stop gossiping about people. Stop whispering behind their back. Don't say negative things about people. If you've got a problem with someone, don't come to me, go to them. Guess what? That pastor is not going to be there very long because they'll start whispering and backbiting and slandering him, you know, and eventually he'll find it that it's better for him to move on to some other place. He learns the hard way not to confront people about their sins. Beloved of God, we have to do better. And so therefore, the first thing that we need to understand is to wake up and to be real men and real women in Christ and recognizing that in this sin-filled world, there are always going to be conflicts, even in the best marriages. I don't care how well-educated, how upper white middle-class your values are, you know, how, 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 how great a background you have, there's going to be conflicts. And if you don't see those conflicts, it's because basically people are not dealing with the conflicts. What they're doing is they're keeping them out at arm's length. They're pretending they don't exist. It's like the redheaded, you know, mutated stepchild that they keep chained in the attic and they hope nobody hears it screaming in the middle of the night. They don't want to deal with the fact. And so people will be nice and they'll be friendly and they'll have a facade on them, but we call them plastic people or sometimes pod people because they look human, but they're not really human. My point here, of course, is that we, everyone has problems. And the question is, how do we resolve the problems? Because remember our general uh, premise here, all the way from Genesis chapter three, is that basically man and woman are one. So it's against chapter two. Man and woman are to be one flesh. They are to cleave to one another. And obviously, if your body is at war with itself, it's sick, it's ill, it's like an autoimmune disease, something it ought not to be. And so our task, our responsibility, is to learn how to bring those differences together and resolve them and take care of them, how to produce the right kind of antibodies, if you will, that will defeat whatever is trying to destroy us and put us out of condition. In fact, as my friend Dave Angel say, if two people always agree on everything, then one of them is unnecessary. And the point is, is that in some churches, Lord bless them, and I'm not trying to be critical of others just to point the finger at them, but I'm saying that one of the problems that happens is that some churches, which are upholding the biblical standard of men being the heads of their households and women have a moral responsibility to submit to their husbands, what that turns into is basically some sort of you know, male sexist, you know, chauvinist pig kind of thing there, where the man is dominant and he's in control, and therefore he's like a, a little little king in his little kingdom, right? And he's ruling everything. And that is not the biblical picture of marriage. 
the biblical picture of marriage is as Christ and his church. <clears throat> That's why in Ephesians chapter five, the apostle Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus said, the son of man did not come to serve, I mean, come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Gentlemen, all of us in here are men. The picture of your duty, your responsibility as a husband and father comes from the Lord Jesus himself. And what did Jesus do? Did he come and have his disciples serve him or did he come to serve his disciples? And that's why we have that famous scene where he washes his disciples' feet. And there's a picture and there's reason why he did it. He took on the form of a servant to say to his disciples, that's the way you serve your people. You're gonna be given great authority and great responsibility. It's not there to make you feel superior. It's not so that you can take advantage of others. Whenever I hear about some preacher, usually one of those televangelists from back in the 80s, making millions of dollars off poor little old ladies giving their social security checks, all I'm thinking of is that person is from hell. That person is perverting everything that the gospel is supposed to be about. And the same thing applies to you as the head of your household. You're not there to be served by your wife and to have children to be little reflections of your ego. You are there to serve them by being a man of God, by standing up, by teaching the scriptures, by, by being helping them to understand the scriptures, to memorize the scriptures, to be catechized and learn sound doctrine in order to present your wife perfect and blameless without sin or stain on the great day of redemption. And that's what you're going to be judged on. That's what makes most important in your life is whether or not the woman to whom you are married is wiser and holier and closer to God because of you and your headship in the church. That's why you're given that responsibility. And yes, women do have a subordinate position, even though they are equal in honor and glory, they have a subordinate position to be a helpmate to their husband. And they have to, they have to basically sacrifice, they serve their husbands and their children by sacrificing sometimes their own goals their own long-term objectives. And, you know, they, they could have been, you know, they might've been a, a physician or they, they, they could have been a, you know, a teacher or they could have been a, a, an executive or they could have been a successful lawyer or whatever it is that fantasy, the modern culture says for a woman. Yeah, they could have done all those things, but they gave those things up so they could be a wife and a mother nurturing her family and presenting it gracious. Service is at the heart of Christianity. It is the heart of Christian morality. So even if you have two people who understand that, there are still going to be conflicts. There are going to be differences of opinion. It could be, it may be, it, you know, it's very possible that you can have two people who are smart, intelligent, savvy, they're committed to godliness, but at the same time, they might have different goals, different objectives in mind. And they may be disagreed upon the which way they're supposed to use limited resources in order to achieve a particular end. Now, you could resolve that by simply saying, well, the man is the head of the household. So shut up, women, and just do what your husband tells you. And if you say that, I will listen to you politely, and I, I won't tell you what I think, because I don't think that you're supposed to answer a fool, you know, according to his own folly, because that's what that statement is. That is the dumbest thing that you could do as a husband, because your wife is there for a reason. She is not there. She's not your first sergeant there to carry out your orders, but rather you are partners. The two shall become one flesh. The two shall cleave unto one another. The goal is for, for you two to bring your thoughts, your ideas, your perceptions, your evaluations together. Two are better than one because if one stumbles, the other will help them along. You know, and many stranded cord is, is more difficult to break. So basically, if you have a disagreement, a conflict between the two of you, it's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong, but how can we work together to achieve the best possible end with the limited resources that we have? And I would suggest, I could be wrong, I'm not all that wise, but I would suggest that in the best of marriages, when husband and wife come together, they talk, they reason, they think, they pray, they, they work through it biblically, and we'll talk about that in a moment. What happens is that eventually, you're gonna forget who came up with the right idea because it's gonna be an organic kind of process that goes on. To the contrary, if you're thinking about, well, I was the one who came up with the right idea, 
why didn't the other person listen to me at the beginning? I could see it clearly that it's really all about your ego and your pride. And it's not about the welfare of the other person or of the family. Men are put in a position to have responsibility for their families in order to serve them. And so therefore, the wise man, understanding that his wife has a different education, different experience, has seen different things, perceives things through a different perspective uniquely, there are things that women see that men don't. And dare I say, it's the same way women as well. I could get into a whole thing here about left and right hemisphere and how the, that affects our perception. Some of that research is no longer valid and some of it's under analysis. And it's hard with the political correctness of today to be able to figure out what's actually been documented and which is basically speculation. But the point is, is that we do know that the two are supposed to become as one, but people are going to have conflict. And so therefore, what we need to do is we need to approach it from a fully biblical perspective. Now, one more caveat. Guys, especially those of you who are still single, this is why it's so important that before you marry someone, you make sure you're on the same page. You make sure you're on the same, you have the same overall ultimate final goal. Men are stupid because they're often led by their eyes. If a girl looks good, then basically everything else goes out the window. And ladies, I, I'm not a woman. I don't have a woman's orientation. I don't have a, a woman's uh, uh, perspective. So I, I can only speak ignorantly about this particular thing. But I have known an awful lot of women over the years who have made the worst decisions about the men that they will date. You know, and there is something in a lot of women, not always, uh, uh, not always, uh, you know, the, the wickedest ones, where they seem to be attracted to the wrong kind of man. And uh, I think that that is something that you have to deal with. Why are you attracted to a bad boy? Why is it that that's something that has an appeal? I'm not sure what the psychology is. Maybe after the service today, you guys can basically inform me and educate me on it. But I see it's awfully common that women will choose the wrong sort of, of man. And men will deliberately seek out the worst kind of woman because they're led by something other than God's principle. Our point here this morning here is that our goal is to be of one mind, of one heart, working towards one particular goal. It's not to avoid conflicts. Conflicts are going to happen, but rather it's how we resolve the conflict and how we reach a conclusion that's important. And that's what Paul was telling Timothy here. And I think those principles still apply to us. First of all, notice the first principle, don't quarrel. Okay. For, well, actually, there's a principle before that, and that is, but avoid foolish arguments and speculations, right? They produce quarrels. Don't, don't do that. Don't get into speculative territory, right? Stay grounded in reality. That's maybe the first principle. But however, the, the, the greater thing here is not to be quarrelsome. Quarrelsome, there are some people who just like to have arguments. And I'm going to suggest it's because they're prideful. And so they want their way, they want, and they're not going to give in. So they'll argue. They'll, they'll de decry, they will ridicule, they will insult. This is not the way that we're supposed to deal with them. And therefore, if your biggest concern in a, and I want, I want to say an argument, I, I use the word argument, generally speaking, as a way of two people presenting ideas or concepts, right? And testing them out against one another. That's a more technical way, like an argument that you would have in a debate. It isn't personal, it isn't nasty. But we usually use the word to argument today in the sense of a quarrel, where two people are just going, to, going at each other. And the thing is, when it's that kind of a quarrel, it's usually about proving yourself right and the other person wrong. And so therefore, ultimately, it's about your pride. It's not about the truth. There might be ways to, if you really want to convert someone, if you really want to change their thinking on something, let me suggest this to you. And it works. I don't do it because I'm a sinner. But I know that it works. And if I can shut my mouth up for five minutes when I'm having a disagreement with someone, the most effective way of dealing with someone, of bringing them to your side, is simply to ask them questions. Where it's easier for me to get on my high horse 
and to turn my mouth up to, you know, you know, by two or three times and start yelling and speaking really fast and really powerful so I can overwhelm the person. That's my sinful temptation. The reality is, is that if you really want someone to hear what you're saying, shut up and ask them questions. Don't let it become a quarrel. Help them to see the implications. Help them to see why what they're saying is actually wrong. That's why James says, let every man be slow to speak and quick to hear, right? Slow to anger, slow to speak and quick to hear. For the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. But you've got to have a certain degree of confidence in the grace of God and the providence of God. You've got to be willing to sit back and say, it's more, it's not about me winning this particular argument and showing how much better I know this or I understand this, but rather I want to help this person to come to a richer, deeper understanding. So let me ask this person questions. And then you follow that up with another question and another question and another question. This is the Socratic method of of teaching. And basically you lead that person to the place. And at the same time, if you're asking someone questions, it might find, you, you might determine or figure out that maybe you didn't really understand what the other person was doing. I can not number the times when I've gotten into a quarrel with someone, you know, over the years, debate or yeah, something like that. And it comes out that at least 75% of the time, the person was upset with me not because of what I said, but because what they thought I said, or they thought there was another agenda. They didn't understand. And I know this is going to be going to be kind of condescending when I say this. Let's be honest. A lot of people aren't as smart as they think they are. And you're not as smart as you think you are. I definitely am not as smart as I think I am. And what that means then is that learning to be slow to speak and slow to anger and quick to hear by asking other people questions and leading them to where you're, what you're trying to say. Basically, it stops the arguing, the quarreling aspect and allows there to be a bit of peace. So in a marriage situation, when you really just want to rip a strip off your spouse because they've said or done something that you didn't like, didn't approve of, maybe instead try to figure out why they did what they did. What was it they were trying to accomplish? And it might be by asking questions of the other person, by not quarreling with them, what you find out is that their reasoning was very good. Maybe they made a mistake somewhere in their reasoning, but then you go, oh, if I had been in that situation, I would have made a similar kind of decision knowing what that person knows, but they didn't know that. And so, okay, we can work through it. However, if it's all about your pride, it's all about showing who's right. It's all about domineering what's going on. And this is one of the reasons why, when I say this, again, it's going to sound bad. I know I don't know how to express it really. It's the reason why ladies, sometimes, especially if you're in your view, you need to give your husband enough rope to hang himself with. Uh, you know, you can get into a fight with him, you can argue with him, and that, that's just gonna just gonna wound it back up because men have got testosterone. And if we see something as a challenge, then you'll either get one of two things: you'll get into a really big, nasty, cantankerous kind of thing, or you'll get a whipped puppy. And uh, if there are wolves outside the door, you don't want a wolf puppy. You know, I mean, excuse me, a whipped puppy guarding your sheep. So you don't want to whip him in the shape that way and make him into you know emasculate him. But at the same time, you don't want to always be living in fear. And one of the ways to do that is basically learning to ask your husband questions and not to be defensive and not to be afraid, but just to ask questions. Guys, I know this works. It's a biblical principle. I used it when I was in the military, when I was a lowly E-5 staff sergeant, and I had a dumb second lieutenant that worked for me that had less time in the service, but he had the authority. And basically, you can't tell second lieutenants you're dumb, even though they're stupid, because they don't know anything. What you have to do is ask them, when, especially when they give you a dumb order. You basically say, sir, okay, I hear you want me to do this, sir? Okay, uh, sir, uh, are you aware of, uh, of you know, you know, AFR, you know, 37, 15, whatever it is, you know, and the implications are, you know, you ask them questions and you lead them down. You don't get into an argument with them. It makes your life a whole lot easier. And any lieutenant that's worth his salt knows that even a junior NCO like E5 has been in the Air Force for six years longer than him, knows how the system actually works. And if he's got anything on the ball whatsoever, he will listen to what his, in fact, what he should do is grab himself a good master sergeant 
you know, an E7 somewhere and, uh, you know, let the E7 teach him how to be an officer. My point here is that it's got to stop being about our pride and our arrogance. People might have lawful, legitimate problems. And so it should be our responsibility in serving one another to figure out what those problems are, articulate it, and then help them to solve it. That is the secret to key leadership. And it's a think secret, I think, to working as a group. Especially since husband and wife are to be one, they need to spend time talking together. And guys, I know you don't want to hear me say that. Sometimes you're going to see what needs to be done and you just want to get on and do it. And your spouse may not be on board with that. And you owe it to her to share with her your thoughts, your ideas, and your plans, and that the two of you come up together with a mutually agreed plan of action, and then you have the responsibility to keep to that plan. And if you have to change it, because plans often have to change, then you have a moral responsibility because the two become one flesh by pleading under your wife to go back to her and let her know why you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. If you want to bring peace to your household, if you want to rekindle the romance in your relationship, if you want to serve your wife and actually help her, then talk with her and together come up with the plan. What is our goal? What is our purpose? What is objective? You are not giving up your headship. You are practicing your headship when you do that. You are making the best possible use of all the people in your family with your responsibility. And when the children get over, you can even occasionally incorporate them into the decision-making process, helping them all to arrive <clears throat> at something that's going to benefit the entire family. And therefore, husbands and wives often have to have long discussions about what to do or how they're going to do it. But they don't have to have arguments about it. And that's the point. Don't let it become a quarrel. Once you start arguing in the bad sense of the word, what you're demonstrating is that it's no longer about the problem, but it's about who gets to solve the problem. Whose solution will we go with? And so you're arguing about pride and position. You're not arguing about what actually needs to be done. This doesn't mean giving in to the other person, but it means simply working together. And I got to say this, that when over the years, as Elena and I had various decisions that had to be made, sometimes it's like, what country are you going to live in? You know? What are we going to do with our children? You know, where are we going to go for education? You know, where are we going to get a job? What part of the country, part of the world are we going to live? All of these things, sometimes we had to fast over it. Sometimes we had to pray over it. Sometimes we had to, to you know, spend a couple of weeks, you know, thinking about various things. But the thing that never happened was never going hammer and, pay, hammer and tongs at one another, fighting each other, arguing over who gets to do what and when they get to do it. Because we always talked about it ahead of time. And so when the decision came to be made, we're both on board. It's not me having my way or her having her way, but rather the two of us together coming up with a plan of action because you shall, this person, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and the two shall become one flesh. That's the goal. And so don't quarrel. Second of all, Remember this, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all. Now, remember, I think sometimes kindness gets bad words or a bad meaning amongst Reformed Christians because a lot of churches that just be nice to people. Kindness is not the same as niceness. Niceness is, is a superficial kind of thing. It doesn't hurt you when you walk into a store to say good morning to the person behind the counter. It doesn't hurt you when you're you know, getting your stuff. If you, you, know, you smile at the, at the checkout clerk and go, how's your day going? Yeah, it's really frustrating. Yeah. A, a kind word like that, that's always kind of nice. But kindness is basically, it's an orientation. It's something that you do. I'm sorry, this is going to sound condescending, but it's something that happens whenever I pick up one of my grandchildren, especially when they're like really super little. And they're just, they're kind of, and I'm not a big baby person, guys. I mean, babies, women love babies. I guess they get old, they remember when, the, when they had their babies and they were so small and cute. I'm not a big baby fan because you're like, okay, I'm with you. You're cute. Okay. I know. Coochie, coochie, coo. Okay. Now, what do you think about the hypostatic union? Don't you have an opinion on that? Come on, come on. 
you know, it doesn't. When the kids get older, when they get to be toddlers and you can actually talk with them and play with them, they are absolutely delightful. But still at the same time, kindness means that you recognize that, that they don't always understand things. They're smaller, they're, they're not as strong. They, they, they have frustrations. So when a child gets really angry with you because they, they wanna do something and you're not gonna let them do it and they will go, you've probably heard this from your own children at one point, you know, I don't like you, you're mean, right? You don't take that personally. You realize this kid is a kid. They're trying to hurt because they feel hurting. And so if you take it personally and go, oh, you, you really you break my heart. Oh, I'm going to go cry in the corner. No, you don't do that, right? Because you, you understand who you are. And hopefully the way you're interacting with this child is in such a way it's for their benefit, not for yours. And so what you do is you help them work through that. And you can say, you know, that's not a very nice thing to say. You shouldn't say things like that. You know what? I love you. I really like you. I really like hanging out with you. You know, you're not trying, you're not going to take it personally. Kindness is basically treating people the way that God in Christ treats you on a regular basis. Every morning when you get up out of bed, that's God's kindness because you deserve to die in your sleep. You know, even though you sometimes, especially when you're older, get older, you get pains and problems and all sorts of things start going wrong with your body. There's still kindness because there's life, there's love, there's joy, there's color, there's good food to eat, there's fun things to drink. There are people around you that are funny or they're interesting or, or they're deep. There's all sorts of things that God gives you every single day. Just walk outside on a, on a nice, one of these nice days we've been having where it's not quite spring yet, but it feels like spring and take a walk for 10 minutes and go, Lord, you're so good. Look at that tree with the, with the, with the buds on it. And eventually there's going, to be, there's going to be leaves in that particular tree. I can hear the birds singing, right? There's a smell in my nose from, you know, probably a fast food restaurant, but it's got the smell of hamburgers. And I love the smell of hamburgers, right? You know, that charcoal kind of smell. There's goodness and grace around us every moment of the day. And what that means, is that's God being gracious to us, even though we live in this horrible fallen world. How much more? are we required to be kind to one another? It doesn't mean we back off the truth. It doesn't mean we let people get away with sin. Sometimes kindness requires that you pick up, you know, your child or your grandchild sometime and you swat them across their backside because they're doing something usually rebellious and wicked or dangerous, right? Like they're, they're you know, they're pushing over their little brother or sister or cousin or whatever. Or they're being mean or whatever. And you got to correct the behavior, but you're not doing it because you're personally offended or because you're, you're angry at the child. You're doing it because you want that child to grow up to be, to be fun to be around, to be responsible, and to be able to control his emotions. If that's true for children, how much more ought it to be true of the way that we deal with one another? That we have to be kind to one another. And especially if we disagree, okay, hun, whatever problem we've got right now, you know, a disagreement on something, you think we should do this, you know, I think we should do that. I really think that we need to spend the money and buy a, a, a new pistol that's actually engraved with a, a, with a holographic sight on it. I think that would be a, a good use of money. You don't think that? Okay, I'm going to listen to your arguments. I'm going to discuss it with you. We're going to think about it. It's not me having my way. I know you want to go spend the money and buy the grandchildren something. Okay, I, I get that. But the grandchildren are going to get this anyway because I'm not going to be around that much. By the time the grandchildren kids are able to carry their own weapon, granddad probably won't be here. So you see there, it's an investment and it'll only get more expensive. We'd be fools not to buy that hand up. We could say that. The point is we don't have to have an argument about it. We don't have to be mean and nasty about it. Thirdly, in terms of this, I only quote a couple of comments here. This goes back to what we were saying earlier. Paul says that you have to be able to teach. And I think what that means is that some of us are not as good communicators as we think we are. And that's okay. People have different gifts, but recognize that. And so when we are disagreeing with our spouse on something, we have to make sure that we're actually communicating. And one of the techniques that really works, I know it's such a happy kind of thing to think about, but one of the techniques that really works is that especially when you're getting into a situation where it's tense, is simply let your partner say whatever it is they want to say, and then try to paraphrase it back to them in your own words. 
And it has, it. and again, we're not trying to play manipulation game, but this exercise is really useful on a couple of levels. Number one, it demonstrates to you that you understand what they're really saying. And again, uh, sometimes what happens is that you're hearing something. Remember, they're not always the best communicator in the world either. So it's gonna take some discussion, some rationale to be able to actually figure out what the other person is always saying. And so if you can say, well, do you mean blah, 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 and you're not being judgmental, you're not criticizing, you're not refuting, you're just asking, clarifying to make sure you understand what goes on. And a lot of times what happens when you do that is your partner says, no, I don't mean that at all. You completely misunderstood me. Okay, so what did you mean then? And you can listen a little bit more carefully. But the other thing that happens, if you get it right, if you go, okay, so what I'm hearing is you saying dot, dot, dot. And the person says, yes, that's exactly what I'm hearing, what I'm saying. And then she goes, thank you. I didn't think you understood. And that's why she has to keep saying it over and over and over again is because you didn't, she didn't think that you got it right the first time. And that it removes a lot of the pressure. And so once you're both on the same page, it, it, you're about 50% to solving whatever the problem is at that particular point. But that means you're able to actually teach, you're actually able to interact with people. So by asking questions, by paraphrasing what the other person is saying, and then by always keeping the kindness thing, this problem, it's not a battle between you and me. It's together, there's a problem out here. And we are here to kill the ogre, right? We're here to go up against the dragon. And we have different strategies, right, of how to get, how to defeat the dragon. All right, that's fine. Okay, obviously dragons are big, nasty, dangerous animals, right? You get it wrong, they're gonna eat you. You're supposed to smile at that. They're gonna eat you, right? Or at least they're gonna blow fire at you or something. So if you're gonna defeat the dragon, you've got to work together, but you've got to have the right plan. So it's not about who gets to be the one that becomes the dragon slayer, but rather how do we get rid of the dragon? We need to work together. Okay, fourthly, how to be patient when wrong. Notice there's a theme going on here, okay? We often as Christians play by, uh, we, we argue, we have conflicts, we solve conflict by, play, by playground rules. And the playground rules are basically this. He hit me first, right? Those of you who grow up with siblings, right? You know that when your parents came in because somebody was crying, somebody was upset, you know, what happened? He hit me. Now, what's the answer? Well, he hit me first. That might work on the playground when the teacher is breaking you up. It might work in your, you know, when you were a kid and your family said, well, don't hit your brother and you won't hit your back. Uh, the reality is that's not biblical. Scripture says very clearly, 1 Peter, do not return evil for evil or insult for insult, but give a blessing instead, for you are called to the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. We are not allowed to treat other people viciously or nastily. It is our responsibility is always to build people up, not tear them down, even though some people really deserve it. But we're not allowed to. That's not the way we approach it. And so therefore, when people wrong you, we have a moral responsibility to be patient. And why do we have a moral responsibility to be patient? Because we wrong God every single day. And rather than God Almighty sending a lightning bolt down and, you know, electrocuting us and wiping us off the face of the earth because we're foul, blasphemous, heretical, stubborn, stiff-necked, idolatrous, blaspheming individuals, instead he is kind and gracious to us, giving us time to repent. And therefore, Christian, if that's what God does for us, how much more must we as sinners give grace to other sinners? And so being patient then basically lets, sometimes people are upset. The personality is different, but some people, they, they're upset and they're, and, and they're angry and they've got all this stuff coming in and it's gonna come, come I don't wanna be too graphic here, but it's gonna come spewing out in all sorts of terrible ways. And basically it's just like when your kids are sick and they're young and they're little and they get upset and basically you have to clean up the mess. You don't get angry at the children you understand that, that you're the one that has to take responsibility. You're taking their clothes off. You're cleaning up the mess on the floor. You're putting them in the bathtub to wash them clean. And you don't want to be nasty, mean, and I hopefully you don't want to be that way. 
you realize that you've been wrong. You just wanted a good night's sleep. The kid is the one who's wronged you by coming in at three o'clock in the morning, all sick and that kind of stuff. You know, this is, a, but you deal with it because that's what parents do for their children. And how much more than husbands and wives do that for one another. And basically love, co- you know, covers a multitude of transgressions. And sometimes it means, doesn't mean that you let them get away with it, but it also means that sometimes maybe they, they, they you're right, they're wrong. And God has to, be, you know, change them inside. We're getting around that in a second. And as a consequence, because God is going to have to change them, you've got to wait for it. Only God can change the heart. If you're bigger and stronger, or if you're meaner and nastier, you can bend people to your will. You can out-argue them. You can out-yell them. You can out crazy them, you know, uh, crazy beat skill every single time. You can really be a nuisance, and you'll get your way. But people won't want to be around you anymore. You're losing out on an intimate deep relationship. You can't unfold and and share and be one. Instead, sometimes you need to learn how to be gentle and gracious and give the other person a chance to repent. And then finally, uh, be gentle with one another. Same thing here. The image image might be that, that, you know, standing toe to toe with your husband's ladies may not be the best way to get what you want. It's probably not going to help him. It's probably not going to help you, even though at the moment it may seem like it's the best way. I mean, that's my personality, I yell, I scream, I you know, swing from the chandeliers. That's that's my personality. It never accomplishes anything that you want. So instead, then we have to trust in the grace and the mercy of God. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Paul tells Timothy, "You're going to be dealing with people. Probably he's in context. He's talking about Jews." that are going to be arguing with him. They're going to want to, def, you know, re, they're try to refute Christ and Christianity. They're going to, they're the ones that have been, been hounding the Apostle Paul throughout his entire ministry. They're going to, they're going to know the scriptures. <coughs> they're going to try to throw things up to get the pick, you get the, the pressure off themselves because they don't want to acknowledge that they need Jesus Christ. And he's saying to them, you need to be gentle with them and kind to them because only God can grant them repentance. And guys, that's exactly what happens. We don't want to win arguments. Winning an argument just means that, you know, you made the other person cry uncle. My brothers did that to me when I was a kid. They were five and seven years older. And we got into an argument with them. The final, no matter how right I was, basically and eventually the way that the argument was solved is they threw me on the ground and they put their arm, you know, they put my arm behind my back And they put pressure on it and say, cry uncle, cry uncle, cry uncle. Okay. Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? Am I the only one that grew up in a dysfunctional family here? Yeah. And the point is, is that, yeah, they got me to cry uncle. And yeah, they got me to, uh, to, you know, to stop hitting myself. And, uh, but they didn't win the argument. It just destroyed or eroded the relationship. It doesn't matter. If you want to win the argument, actually win you need to win the person, not the idea. And that means working together by the grace and the mercy of God. And that means being gentle. <clears throat> now, recognizing this, let's also remember this. Even though I've given you all these principles today, let's be honest about it. You will fail. I will fail. We all will fail because we are sinners who fall short of the glory of God. I would like to say, here are these three easy steps. Follow these and you'll never have an interpersonal conflict again. No, you'll have one probably before the day is out. The point is, is that even if you know the principles, even if you memorize it, even if you go home right today, and I encourage everyone to do this, to memorize this first from 2 Timothy 2 and have it on your heart, you'll see it work out and you'll be in the middle of a confrontation or a conflict with someone and you'll know, you'll hear my voice in breath echoing in your head saying, don't do that, dummy. And you'll do it anyway, because guess what? You're a sinner who falls short of the glory of God. And I think this is where the final principle comes into apply. And that is to be ready to forgive. And that is what the Lord Jesus himself gave to us. That was the whole point of his ministry. That's why he came and died in our place. 
And that's why when, when Peter comes up and says, Lord, you know, how many times should I forgive my brother? Up to seven times? And Jesus says, no, up to 70 times seven. And that isn't, you know, whatever, 70 times seven is 490, whatever. That isn't what he's talking about there. What he's saying there is that it's an infinite number of times. Forgiveness is what we owe one another because God in Christ forgave us. Forgiveness is not a get out of jail free card. It's not a way of going, oh, I can be sinful. I can be rebellious. I can be wicked. And then I can say, please forgive me. And I, you know, therefore I don't have to pay the consequence. There may well be terrible consequences to it. But the forgiveness aspect is what gives us peace and what heals the relationship. If you find that when you're in a confrontation with one another, and I have pictures in my head of growing up as a child, and I won't go into detail about it, but you know, basically you start bringing up who said what, when, year from years before, who offended who, who started this particular conf- you know, confrontation from 20 years ago, you've already lost what's the most important. Doesn't matter who, who gets to sleep on the couch that night, who goes to the local motel, you know, who gets separated, that doesn't matter. What matters is you've both lost at that particular point. Rather than justify, rationalize, or explain away or excuse our sins, we have to, first of all, stop playing that game and just admit it. You know what? I sinned. You're right. I shouldn't have said that. You know what? I said I was going to do this, and, and I didn't do it. And that was wrong because I made a promise to you, and I didn't keep that particular promise. Please forgive me. And I'll, you know, by the grace of God, I'll see about if I can make some changes in how I think or how I act so that I can be not that person anymore. And there's a whole dynamic that happens when we learn to live in forgiveness for one another. I will say this, I said it before, I'll say it again. It's one of the things I'll probably be saying when they're throwing dirt in my face, and that is never go to bed angry. If you've got a problem with your spouse, resolve it. It doesn't always mean that you can fix everything, but it says in Ephesians chapter four, be angry, but do not sin and do not let the sun go down in your anger. And that means that if you're angry and you might be righteously angry, maybe your your partner did something stupid or dumb or sinful, and you really have a right to be angry. But what you also have is a duty to be reconciled. So that person needs to repent and say, I have sinned against God. I have sinned against you. I repent of this. Please forgive me. And then sometimes the problem is going to be so big that you can't resolve it then necessarily. You're not going to be able to work all the things out. But if you're willing to forgive each other, you can lay that knife in each other's arms, snuggle up to each other, say, I love you sincerely to one another. And the two of you can be one flesh, not in any kind of in a metaphorical sense here, you can be of one mind and one heart, even if you know we've got a lot of work to do to actually deal with this particular character issue down the road. And it might be a pretty big one. And that's why we have pastors and elders to help us work through those particular issues. But the point is, is that you never have to feel hopeless in your marriage as a Christian. You never have to feel like this person isn't worth my time, that this is a horrible individual. And we can talk about the extreme things here, but what we're talking about here is the way that most Christians are living their lives. We can be at peace with God and at peace with one another. And that's how we attain unity inside the family. And when we maintain that unity in the family, we bring that same unity into the church. We resolve our conflicts and our problems together by dealing with them on a regular basis, kindly and humbly, being quick to repent and even quicker to forgive. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness, grace, your mercy, and your love. Thank you that you forgive us every moment of every day. Thank you, Lord, that you wash us clean. And Lord, we humble ourselves before you. And whatever sins are poking around all of our consciences right now, Lord, we don't want to sin. We we don't want to break your commandments. We don't want to give in to our own anger, fear, frustration, lust, passion, whatever it is. We want to be your man or your woman. And sometimes, Lord, we don't know how to become that. We're at an impact. So there's a, something blocking the way. But Lord, in faith and confidence, we turn to you and ask for the work of your Holy Spirit to do whatever it is that he does inside our hearts and our minds to grant us repentance to grant our partners repentance, Lord, so that we can forgive one another, we can be reconciled to one another, 
the problem itself can be resolved and that we can grow closer to you and to one another to glorify your name. So help us, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.